Kia ora everyone, my name's Zach, I love rugby. Welcome back to Time Rugby. Guys, teams have just been announced for both Ireland and Wales. And with that, we've got everything we need to do a full preview of this upcoming match. Now, both teams come in here undefeated. So this match has huge implications for the remainder of the tournament. For that reason, I think this is the match of the week, um, without a doubt. There's just so much riding on this and so many questions that we have to answer in all of this. So right now, I'm going to break the whole match down, guys. I'm going to go through the team selections. We're going to go and look back at last week's performances. What have we started to learn now? What questions have we had answered with both last week's performances, with this week's squad selection? and who is going to win this match. I'm going to answer all of those questions right now for you. So let's get straight into it, guys. Let's start off with Ireland. Team was announced on Tuesday. What's interesting about this squad? couple of changes, but really injury force changes. Um, so obviously in comes um, Peter Armani, Kaylin Doris, Unfortunately, has not recovered in time for this match. Very, very promising young player. When I did the original preview for the Six Nations for Ireland, he was one player that I identified very, very um, early. What I thought is just his high work rate, um, you know, excellent young player. I thought he'd have a real impact on the Six Nations, a potential superstar there for Ireland. He came in last week, four solid minutes, one turnover. He really looked like he was going to be someone that could take over that game. And what we saw from a Scottish perspective was certainly a lot of contestability there at the breakdown. So having a guy like Doris there would have been very valuable. Unfortunately, got injured early. We know that concussed in came Peter Omani. Now, this Ford pack in particular looks very, very settled. Same team as last week. Obviously, world-class front row, world-class locks, world-class loose forward trio. Um, and to a degree, I mean, this is a this is a highly, highly experienced loose forward trio. And, and the loose forward trio is going to be very, very telling for the outcome of this match. But with CJ Stander, Josh Van Der Flair, and, um, and Peter Omani, you have just a stack of experience there. Um, I really like seeing CJ Stander at six. I'm not normally a fan of having players out of position. Um, I think as a ball-carrying physical uh, loose forward. He can very easily interchange between six and eight. I just feel like he gets a few more options. And I've spoken at length about this um, with Unbiased Rugby as well. Make sure you go and check out his channel. But we just both feel that he is, his best position in, is at six. Um, he'll play eight here today. That's fine. Um, those roles, as, as I say, are somewhat interchangeable. Um, but that may be an area that he looks to focus on later uh, as these selections and this, this tournament rolls on. So very much a settled forward pack here for Ireland. In the back line, the major change is Robbie Henshaw comes in. Obviously, uh, Gary Ringrose went off injured last week. Um, so Henshaw slots in. He's, a, he's an experienced guy. And overall, again... The benefits that we identified with this um, this backline last week, they hold true again. You don't lose too much. I really, obviously, Gary Ringrose is a very, very good player, but Robbie Henshaw is an experienced guy. Certainly, from a defensive structures perspective, he will um, he will fit the bill here. Um, and that inclusion of Jordan Lama there at the back gives enough excitement. Now, Jordan Lama did show us a little bit last week. He showed us what he can do with ball in hand. He made a number of really telling breaks, um, and I think he'll only get better here for Ireland. Uh, talking points. So how would uh, Johnny Sexton go as captain? I thought he went very, very well. Obviously, he's Leinster captain. So he slotted in, scored all of Ireland's points last week, had a great game there. So I expect the same. I expect him to continue to build, and I expect him to um, to lead this team very, very effectively. Uh, Connor Murray. I didn't think Connor Murray had a great game last week. There's been a lot of talk about John Cooney. Um, John Cooney, I'd like to see him get more minutes here for Ireland this week. Um, it's fine if they want to take a slow approach to blooding in new players, but you know you need a bit more dynamic um, output from that nine position. There probably wasn't enough there from Connor Murray. Cooney didn't really show us enough in that last um, that last twenty minutes that he came on. So I'd certainly like to see him get some more minutes. And this is a prime example where teams have really got to consider the full output of the role of scrum half. Um, the full 80 minutes as opposed to just focusing on the starter um, and the bench player. So good opportunity here for a strong rotation if they can get the timings right and bring in that dynamic um, approach from Cooney relatively early this week. So overall, a settled squad here. I mean, coming into 2020, a lot of questions were asked about, you know, obviously Ireland were world, you know, pretty much best team in the world in 2018. 2019, it just started to feel like 
you know, they were stale in terms of their any strategic changes or or major um, different approaches. Obviously, a number of players came under criticism in that World Cup for maybe being a little bit too old. Joe Schmidt was um, came under criticism as well for maybe holding on to players for a little bit too long. So the big questions were how would this Irish Irish team turn up in 2020? What we've seen is more of an evolution as opposed to revolution under Andy Farrell. And I think that's the right approach. I mean, it's very difficult to make drastic changes in teams unless you're doing a full refresh of the squad like uh, like France has done. But that's a very, very high-risk approach. So Ireland has certainly made their intent clear. This is who they believe are the best players in Ireland, and they're certainly backing them to do the job this week. Whether or not that will be enough remains to be seen. Probably one of the big issues I had with the performance last week. Now, overall, I thought the forwards, while they were being outplayed in certain areas, they did enough here. It felt like a workman-like performance there from the Irish forwards, particularly that loose forward trio. They did enough to really hold off the strong charge of the um, of the Scottish loose forwards. And Peter Omani, CJ Stander, Josh Van Der Flair were central to that. I did think they lacked a bit of variety in attack. Um, Ireland has traditionally been from an attacking perspective. A lot of one out the ruck play, um, a lot of forward dominated, uh, you know, first receiver plays. They just seem to lack a little bit of variety, but we did see some good variety there with, um, there was a couple of times where Conor Murray acted as first receiver. And then that gave an opportunity for um, Johnny Sexton to act as the second receiver. And then from there, there was, you know, a number of interplays. The way the way that uh, Sexton's try played out was exactly this. It was Conor Murray slotting into first receiver. Um, it was loose forward passing it to Conor Murray. Conor Murray passing it to a trailing runner in Johnny Sexton and exploiting a gap down that 13 channel. Now, I expect them to continue down that line. I think both... Um, through Johnny Sexton there as a run behind option, through um, Henshaw there as well, and also through Jordan Lama as that link player. I think we're going to see a lot of attacking variety that will head down that way. That as well as their typical um, one out the ruck um, attack, I think that's what we're going to see from Ireland. Whether or not that will be enough remains to be seen. Um, But overall, it feels like a stable squad. From a strategy perspective, I expect them to be relatively um, consistent with last week's performance. I really think big games are needed here from Conor Murray if Ireland want to be successful. If Conor Murray can have a good game, try and game manage this. Because we know that the kicking ability and the game management of a Welsh team, obviously the forward-dominated um, activity that they've traditionally done, it's going to be there and it's going to be difficult to um, um, to combat. So Conor Murray needs to be his one player in particular that Ireland needs to stand up here and to help control the game. Also, I'm very interested in how they're going to position that rotation, as I mentioned, with the overall nine position, whether or not they opt for a more dynamic approach earlier in the game. I do think they should do that, and I do think that'll help them put points on the board later. Later in this match because they will be on offer in this game. So that's my thoughts on Ireland, guys. Overall, yes, they can do the job here. Yes, they are at home. Yes, they have a relatively good um, record here against Wales at home, but we just haven't seen enough dynamic um, and variety in attack to really give us confidence that this team has resolved those issues that we saw last year. So, but are they good enough to beat Wales? Let's talk about Wales. Now, they announced their team not too long ago. Very, very experienced forward pack. We know how good they are. We know how experienced they are, obviously, with the captain who has been there, done it all, seen it all. Um, and with that world-class loose forward trio of um, Faletau, Tipperick, and Wainwright. Faletau, overall, I thought he had a mixed bag last week, but he was certainly enough of a physical presence there. It was probably a good introduction back in here for him um, there against Wales. He's going to be a lot more tested in this game. So the question is going to be, can they stand up against what is a very, very good um, Irish loose forward trio? From a backs perspective, there are a couple of changes. So probably the two big ones, the inclusion of um, of Nick Tompkins here at outside centre, as well as moving George North out to the wing. Now, there's two things I want to say here, guys, on this. I thought George North and uh, Johnny McNichol last week were defensive liabilities in their respective positions. Now, I've watched a a bit of commentary from various people 
um, on the performance of Johnny McNichol, performance of George North, and people have sort of highlighted that one missed tackle only for George North. He actually had a pretty good game, and it's a bit unfair, the criticism put on him around that defensive channel. Um, but one thing I want to say on this, I think that's a misleading stat to state there was only one missed tackle. He was actually caught out in defense a couple of times. I saw two instances where he rushed out of the line to try and stop the play, and quick thinking from the attacking player to exploit the gap that he had left actually meant that George North did not touch the attacking players at all. He became a moot point, but he did leave a big gap there um, in his defensive slot that he should have been taking down the 13 channel. So, of course, you're not going to have those recorded as missed tackles if he is not making contact with the ball runner, right? But those channels were exploited with him out of position. So for me, that was always going to be a challenge. And in particular, with Ireland preferring to attack down that channel, would they make changes in order to shore up defense there? The answer is yes, right? So with Johnny McNichol, he missed six tackles last week. Now we get um, George North there is far better defender on the wing, in my opinion, than he is at 13. There's just too much required there from a decision-making perspective. Um, you know, the, the 13 is so critical in a defensive line that it just looked like George North may be a defensive liability there. Johnny McNichol may be a defensive liability there. But these selections are, in my opinion, exactly what Wales need, right? Nick Tompkins had a great performance, and we're going to see more of him here. Um... One thing in particular as well, he acts like a second or, sorry, a fourth loose forward here. His ability of the ball is very, very good. We're seeing that a lot more from centers these days. High IQ, rugby IQ, obviously, high decision-making IQ, um, great attackers and defenders, as well as ability to contest at the breakdown. Nick Tompkins is exactly in that mold, so it's great to see a bit of depth being built there at outside center for Wales. Really, really good. So... Outside of that, probably the other, no other major changes worth highlighting from the backline perspective of Wales. Um, experienced campaigners, Dan Bigger, um, Josh Adams with his try scoring capability, Hadley Parks, um, and then obviously Lee Halfpenny there at the back. Um, it'll be good once Liam Williams gets back. That'll certainly improve. Um, Liam Williams, in my regard, is probably the best fullback in the Six Nations um, in all of Europe. And it's a shame Jonathan, Jonathan Davies isn't there, but a great opportunity here for Nick Tompkins to get a run at outside center. I'm very, very excited about how Nick Tompkins will go here. Um, and as a result of that, this back line looks, it looks pretty good. Um, obviously, Wales last year had a very good 2019, coming close in that semi-final to South Africa, the eventual champions. Um, and it was built upon pretty much the squad. Now, you add in a little bit of youth and enthusiasm. Um, you add in a little bit of variety that they've mixed in as well. One thing that I noticed here from a Welsh attacking strategy perspective was they're tending to go through to the second receiver, and that can either be a forward pod who really um, you know tries to get a bit of go forward there in the defensive line, or it could be with a decoy runner. But the whole intent here is to use the full width of the field, and we're certainly seeing that with this Welsh team. They're using that width a lot more dynamically. So ball will go out, second pass, second receiver will take the tackle, ball then comes out um, around the back to either the link player, um, and then eventually heads out to the wing. So I'm expecting them to use that strategy both sides of the field, and that'll see them use the full length of the field. Um, what's surprising, though, is they have changed strategy somewhat. They're no longer kicking more predominantly for field position within that contestable zone between the 22s. What they're electing to do is run and um, look to target the edges of the field, as I mentioned, using the full length of the field. Um, I don't think that fully plays into the strengths here of Wales. I do think the whole mindset around kick and contest the ball proved very, very successful for them last year. Built on a strong suffocating defence, I thought that was a great strategy, which was used and developed probably further by the Springboks, uh, the eventual champions. But that style is becoming a real suffocating style, um, a real high return, low risk style, and something that I would have preferred to see Wales persevere more with. They've elected for a more attacking mindset, and we certainly, I, I expect we will see more of that this week as well with um, Nick Tompkins there. So let's see if they can control the game enough with that attacking style um, to play in the right areas of the field. That's probably my only concern with that 
um, input and it's clearly come in here um, from uh, some subscribers have told me that it's more in line with how the Scarlets play. Um, obviously Wayne Pivex got some experience there. So he's starting to have this imprint on this team, whether or not that is heading in the right direction, whether or not it's building enough on the su success of 2019. I'm not so sure. Um, I would prefer to see them control games more, game manage games with the boot and with contestable high balls and contestable zones, as opposed to looking to run and attack. Maybe it's a little bit of, um, you know, uh, the New Zealand mentality that's starting to creep in through Wayne Pivak. Let's see. But overall, I think we've got a very, very challenging match here. On the one hand, and I'll start to work through my prediction now. On the one hand, you've got Ireland, who in my opinion probably hasn't evolved enough um, and well, they have added some variety to attack. They've certainly got, you know, quite a familiar look about them in both strategy and both um, selections. They do have some good young players, and I believe they will look to target that center channel. Um, but really, they need Conor Murray to stand up. Um, he must have a good game, and he must control this game. On the other side, I do think Wales are looking very, very dangerous right now. Right, against Italy, it's hard to judge how good that performance was. Um, they certainly had some defensive liabilities there, as I mentioned there with George North and Johnny McNichol, um, but they seem to have resolved those. Right, They seem to have focused in the right areas in selections to shore up some of those issues. And that's a really good sign of a new coaching staff. Right, They put something in place. Yes, it was against Italy. Um, then now they maybe it didn't work and now they've pivoted and made, made some changes. And this to me, what we're probably going to see here is this looks like close to the best squad that Wales can put out. Obviously, Liam Williams still has to go back, but they're starting to settle on their squad, as are Ireland. Um, overall, I just think Wales offer a little bit more um, in this match. They've certainly got the forward power there to compete and possibly get some ascendancy there against Ireland. And they've got a little bit more excitement, I think, in the back line. Josh Adams is a, he's a, he's proving to be a very, very good player that pops up at the right place at the right time. And I think he's going to score another couple in this one, right? Just the way the defensive structure is going, it's looking to target the wings. He is certainly going to get opportunities. You add in some exciting young guys like Johnny McNichol. You have what is a settled um, team that can really control games. I thought... Thomas Williams last week as well was very, very good. And um, Dan Bigger there, obviously very accurate with the boot, uh, very consistent there from a game management. They just look like not only are they highly experienced, not only have they proven um, a capability to win um, in recent times as well, but they are also just a very settled team. I think they're starting to build to a team that is close to the top of the powers. So for me in this one, my prediction, Wales get the win. Wales win by, I think it's it's going to be relatively comfortable. I won't say that it's an easy um, uh, game, but I think they're going to win by eight points. And it's going to be a similar style to how Ireland controlled that game against Scotland, where even though it was close in patches, even though it looked like Scotland were coming back, it just felt like Ireland were controlling that game. They were sort of keeping Scotland out at arm's length throughout the majority of that game. And I expect the game management here in particular through Thomas Williams, um, through Dan Bigger, uh, through Lee Halfpenny, who will inject with the, with the boot as well. I just think the game management capabilities of Wales are probably a little bit better than the game management capabilities of Ireland. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, actually, Gareth Davies is back on the bench, so they've got a really, really good opportunity to do a dynamic switch there, um, game manage this game, but also you know, an experienced guy, very, very quick, very, very dynamic, an additional attacking weapon there. So that's my prediction, guys. Let me know what you think. Overall, I'm predicting Wales win this by eight points. As I mentioned, two great teams, very, very experienced teams. I just feel like Wales have a few extra um, weapons available to them, and they're probably coming in here just a little bit more consistent and with a little bit more momentum in my view. Let me know what you think, guys. Please, if you like this content, guys, hit like for me because, um, you know, it really does help the channel out. Please subscribe to the channel because I'm covering all sorts of Six Nations content. Um, I've rambled on a lot here, guys, so I want to hear from you. Let me know what you think. Like always, I'll be responding to all comments. That's it from me. Enjoy the rugby this weekend, guys. We've got so much more content coming. I'm going to be dropping another preview very, very soon on England and Scotland, and I will see you all back here soon.